Hello everyone, we are at the end of our unit and we are preparing for assignment two. This is the last podcast from me. Uh, we have part one and part two. And um, from now on, what we will focus on is the discussion board and we'll be helping one another to actually get these drafts uh, up to a level that you can actually comfortably submit assignment to. So, basically before I actually explain to you um, the model of planning a unit of work, I need to actually put it in focus so you can actually relate it to your other studies rather than basically think that you always um, learn a new model, different teacher, different model. That could be true, but I would like you to have it actually in some context. So basically, I just uh, looked, for this reason, I looked at the paper by Robin Alexander. I am sure that you, I mean, I am positive that you must have heard of this man before. He's a key professor in literacy in um, the UK. And he, in 2005, I believe, somewhere I have actually, he has the link to him, to this paper. It's online, it's free. So he wrote this paper where he basically said in 1981, there was a person with this name, Brian Simon, who actually accused pedagogy and education, but basically they have no pedagogy. They actually have nothing they can actually give to teachers. That's in 1981. My background is actually uh, firmly in um, second language teaching. It was my, my primary background. And then I added onto it other skills. But my first basic education was in actual language teaching. And I think that in language te teaching, we already had particular understandings at that time that we actually knew what to do. Nevertheless, that's the claim. So uh, Robin Alexander is actually criticizing, as you will read if you find time, not necessarily for this unit, but it's nice to actually one day do, uh, browse through his paper. And bas basically what he's saying here, that um, in his paper, who, he will actually examine the claim of Brian Simons against what's happening currently in the UK. And what he did, he looked at the, uh, at the teaching strategy, which is a policy that was written by uh, the UK government for teaching literacy. And he looked at it and he was looking for pedagogy or anything he could actually see that teachers could use as hooks. Now, for your information, there's a problem in the Anglo-Saxon way in which people actually understand what policy is. Very often in, in the Anglo-Saxon system, the policy makers want to stay away from pedagogy. However, they can't help themselves, so they blur the boundary. And actually, the policy documents also talk a little bit, and sometimes too much, about pedagogy. So on the one hand, um, the policy people would like to say things like, we need to ensure that every child has access to education. We need to ensure inclus inclusion. We need to ensure that, yes, that learning is enjoyable experience. So all of these things come from sociology and come from different scientists who have actually, actually something to do with well-being and understanding what the purpose of education is in a kind of larger picture. But because they step into pedagogy as well, what Robin Alexander did, he was throughout his article actually trying to uh, show us that it doesn't matter how much he looked at different aspects of the policy for literacy teaching in the UK, he couldn't find anything that he could actually identify as principles. So he actually talks about things like that he, you know, there's precious little for anyone. He talks about basically motherhood statements masquerading as principles, right? So he's very critical about it. And so am I, of course. But he has his agenda. And and so do I, right? We all, doesn't matter where we come from, from what kind of um, uh, schools of thought, we all want the children to succeed. Nevertheless, he's very critical here. So in his outfit, there's this man, I, I mean, I looked at, at um, Alexander's method, and I also looked at Professor Mercer's method. And basically what they do, they do what you already know from other units, which is they do Vygotsky, they do zone of proximal development. They do things like the teacher knows what to say so that the child can progress. And they also focus on a dialogue between children. Now, 
if you push me really hard, I would say, well, Vygotsky was a hundred years ago. The people who Robin Alexander and this other guy quote were writing about 70 years ago. So what's new? Had it not been for, and those people were actually like Bruno and whoever were actually writing within the tradition of Vygotsky. The question really is, is there anybody else? I mean, you can imagine that there, are, there must be millions of people doing research just now all, all around the world. And it somehow doesn't penetrate into education. So we're still quoting Vygotsky. And basically what I wrote here um, is that maybe Vygotsky talked about dialogue however he talked about dialogue. Let's let him die and be in that grave. But since then, people actually have looked at the concept of dialogue and said there is more to dialogue than two people talking. There was even a contemporary of Vygotsky who was saying, and actually Mercer in this particular video we have here, he does quote Bakhtin, but he doesn't understand Bakhtin. He doesn't even go into Bakhtin because Bakhtin says that there's only a disagreement. There's only, there's only, there's, there's never me. There's always someone else in my head. There's always someone else in my head. Every sentence I pronounce is always someone else's. And it's true. We are connected. We are not isolated. If we were isolated, it would be idiots, idiosyncratic and incomprehensible. So the connection is not necessarily what Vygotsky is saying by being the same, sharing, it's actually by connecting, but in our way, the way it works for us. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into it because this is not a PhD unit, but I just wanted to say that the, that the concept of dialogue has moved, and whether it's neuroscience or whether it's semioticians, we all agree nowadays that we need to look at the concepts of culture, the way the brain processes information, the way who we are, how, how much split we actually are as opposed to how much one we are. Um, in, if we want to actually talk about the concept of dialogue, otherwise what we are actually, what happens that we actually use the, the, the common sense. We know dialogue is two people talking. This is a wonderful video. I strongly encourage everyone to read, to watch this video who is in middle school and high school, because th this actually offers you wonderful tools for analyzing texts. So at any rate, whatever we want to do, we want to get away from common sense. We want to actually now bring in knowledges from different fields so that they can inform the concept of what meaning is and how children or students or people construct meaning on the basis of what. So um, just to continue a little bit with the concept of dialogue, just to actually make the point, I've written a PhD on it so um, some time ago, so that's why I'm sort of, uh, well, um, probably placed in this area. Um, this, this is what people in artificial intelligence say. Before, it was easy to think that, you know, um, we will just create a robot and it will be just great. What they found out that, that it is much easier to teach a robot to win chess game than actually to do simple things like a rec recognize face or um, any sort of activities that have to do with perception. Perception is very complex, and I have already actually spoken to you about perception being complex, and I have spoken to you about things that the brain doesn't actually match things. It's not a machine, and even machine probably doesn't match it that simply. We have these sort of common sense thoughts in our head, oh, well, we just see things, right, with our eyes at a camera. Well, the, as I will repeat again, this is very important, the brain sees, connects things. The brain doesn't see things, the brain activates things, connects things. There are neurons specific for particular shapes, for particular edges, for particular contrasts. Our brain breaks the world into parts and there is no one neuron, one, ob one, neuron, one object perception. So this, um, <clears throat> I'll leave it for you to read if you want to, but basically what we have, the brain is basic, connects um, neurons and generates infinite combinations of mutually reinforcing modalities. Now, I will talk about it a little bit more, just for one second, because I want you to see how neuroscientists actually see the world nowadays. This is from my other research uh, that I might not show you too I will show you some bits of it. But basically what they say, this is, this is the, the biggest neuroscientist in the world, 
uh, Professor Ramachandran, V. S. Ramachandran. Uh, he works in the University of California. And look what he's saying. So there are particular ways in which the brain organizes information. So they're very small here because they, you know, from my own other PowerPoint I, do, I did for Harvard. But the thing is here, look at this, what he says. The process, the, so grouping is the process of discovering correlations, not finding them. Right? There is no something to find, which is what Vygotsky wants students to do. They, he wants them, he wants to find them. They want to do match words with practices. There's no such a thing like matching. There's nothing to match. Uh, so, but he's saying, what Ramachandran is saying, after you know, 30, 40 years of research in neuroscience, he says the process of, say, grouping, of organizing information, it's not about finding correlations, but discovering. And discovering those which reinforce what for the organisms uh, provides incentives. It, it's, it's actually worthwhile, right? It seems like, oh my God, that reinforces something that actually allows me to do something. So it's always strategic for the purpose. So you see the purpose, like even the people from Vygotsky were saying, from those days, were saying that all action is purposeful. That is true. So your perception is driven by your purpose, not by what is out there. And the purpose is actually perceived according to your individual history, according to your, the things that the, the, the trajectory you design for yourself as you live. So anyway, any of you who would want to read all this, uh, all these definitions of different ways in which the brain processes information, you might. I, you've got the PowerPoint and you've got this here. But that's what I was really trying to say. Every, look at this. The brain. Contra the, organizes by contrast, of course you do, right? You, you walk into the room and if it is completely black, you can't make sense out of it. But if you have a dim of light, what happens, you start actually generating contrast by discarding redundant information to reinforce or allocate attention, right? Because the brain cells always compete for attention because you're always in the overload. So the brain goes, there will I look or there will I look? You know, so there is a lot of activity happening. And the reason why I'm pressing this so much, this point in our unit, is basically for you, not as teachers, for you not to actually, when, when you are in school, to, to get desperate, to get to, um, uh, to worry that you might be a bad teacher or something. I want you to always understand that, and, and we will be doing in the part two of this, uh, of this video. I want you to understand that children need opportunities to break down information. If the, if the brain breaks the world into parts, we need to give the students tools to break down the things we give them to study so that they can connect the lines with color or maybe face cells of particular kind with different features, you know, different things they need to connect and bring together in meaningful relationships and all, this is this, this these are brain waves i'm just not going to go into it the point is we need to give them tools so that they can take the complex and play with it a little bit to make sense out of it rather than us basically thinking that once we actually but we can bang it into their heads which is what direct instruction does right we can just just put it there and even if you do you, you will get out only what you put in and the world is much more complex, as the people in artificial intelligence found out. So what else do I have here? This is very interesting. This is, I, I continuously talk about this individualization and this man in this particular, this professor on this particular video I was watching today. I might just make this um, penguin thing a bit larger so you can see the title. And what he talks, he's a poet, but he's also a scientist. So what he's talking about is that we should, we should, we, we, we don't teach people how to be, how to be part of the community. We teach them as how to have their voice, their individual voice in the communities. So he, well, the reason why I'm saying this here is that we shouldn't be banging people into a shape and, and doing things in order for them to be one and speak with one voice with shared meaning. We actually want differences so that the world builds on those assemblages that each of us creates. And what he's saying right to, towards the end of this video, well, he's saying that all penguins are the same. And that's the problem. 
the penguins are all the same. They're all, you know, it, it, the perfect community with, and every penguin is a master, an expert, because they're all the same. So how does one recognize the other? So what he's saying, what the scientists found out is that penguins generate particular voice pitch, each differently. They have their own tune. Everyone has their own little voice. And that's how they recognize one another, probably by smell as well, I don't know. But that's what he was talking about. They have their own authoring voice, their own voice. They're not anonymous. And if we talk about being literate, we don't talk about, uh, because it's very, it's very typical in, in education, and not only, but in education specifically, that we just lump everyone into a bin and we want them to pop out at the end of the semester with a score, but they got really high score. And we want a high score, but if we always think of them as being the same, we're actually fighting nature. So unlike what um, other people in the past were saying that people are just individuals, they weren't saying they were just individuals. They always knew that people were connected. But just to actually now bridge all those different bits and pieces of different thinking approaches, I cannot stop myself from continuously quoting myself here in, this, in, this, in our class, but basically saying, what we need to do in classroom is to engage students' interpretations of the world, because that's the st it's students who are doing learning, right? So we need to engage how they think. Because if we f keep fooling ourselves that they are all the same, we're basically, even if they were, we don't know that. Even if it was true, we don't know that. So it's a better bet to actually try to engage their interpretations of the world than to fool ourselves and say they're all the same, they just need the same methodology, the same questions, the same processes and all, you know, they're just gonna memorize the whole thing and we'll just bang them into shape. It's a very unsafe bet. So what I'm saying is engage their interpretations, enable them to explore, which is the second line here, how they think and what other, way, what other ways are possible to actually think of the same things differently. And they can ask themselves and explore what works for them, which is the same what uh, Ramachandran was saying. The body will perceive, the brain will perceive what works for the brain, not what works for nobody. Um, so there, and even if teachers will think, oh, well, we got the answer we wanted, very often it's a short-term short -term illusion because after some time kids don't remember because they can only overload themselves this much with a short memory. Okay, so we need to in engage their own interpretations. We need to enable them to explore those interpretations and they can explore just talking to one another, which is what Vygotsky said. Well, Vygotsky, I'm not blaming poor Vygotsky. The guy lived 100 years ago. There was a, it was a different world. Plus he was in communism. What do we want from him? But anyway, they need to explore, not by talking in classroom to each other only, because if you only have in classroom two people or seven people, that's a very miserable world, right? Very few people. Even if you have 25 children, it's still not enough. The world is bigger. We need to enable children to explore the resources of their cultural learning against many other. We need to bring the world into the classroom and also take the children out of the school as well, but also bring the world. And today, when we have all these resources, all this internet, all this world everywhere, uh, we can download things, we can bring them uh, recorded on our, if, if the school doesn't allow you to use the technology in a more direct way, you can actually download things and bring them into classroom. Either way, oh my God, you have the best job in, on the planet. You're like a travel agent, right? But if you, and, 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 and everybody wants to travel. But if you locate the discussions only to the people who are in the classroom, then it, you actually limit the children. You limit their opportunities to explore. There's a particular philosopher in Canada who would say, if you bring 10 geographers into the room and all of them think that the earth is flat, what do you think will be their conclusion about the earth? And I'm saying these things because there are still these old discourses in education that say, ideal situation is one-on-one. -on -one. I am positive that one-on-one -on -one does something, but it's not ideal because the world is not one-on-one. -on -one. If there is a magnificent monk somewhere sitting on the mountain, we don't know about him or her, he has probably very little impact on, directly on our lives because we're not talking to him. It's not part of our life. Right, the world is not just one-on-one. -on -one. 
So, you know, I'm not going to fight the idea that one-on-one -on -one is positive, but I, cer I certainly will, will stand for the cause that we that one-on-one -on -one cannot exhaust opportunities of learning because it would be a very, very narrow life and world that we would present to children. And also when we actually enable these explorations of students' interpretations, then we, as I said last time in our, like, in our class, we actually give them, enable, give them more uh, perspectives. We give them actually f tools to build the world, about, to, to build a picture of the world in which they live. Now I need to show you this picture. I'm not. I'm sure it's in our resources, but I'm. But I never know what you look at or or not. So there is this research done in University of South Australia, and what they basically did, they did the genealogy of uh, of a, a literacy classroom in Australia, and basically that's the model: teacher in front asking questions, basically satisfied with the answers the teacher gets. There's no exploration. There is no. Um, in even individualization, because basically what the teacher is trying to do is to get on with the program and with the particular goals as the teacher thinks the school wants from him or her. So everybody is looking at and you know how people in the past and you'll be exposed to it, but it's not always correct. What you will hear that it was called teacher centered. The the the, the, the bad pedagogy is never teacher centered. The bad pedagogy is always book centered. Right, so you have this big book with which you waltz in into the classroom, and everybody looks at this book as if it was, I don't know, uh, some sort of important thing. So, so that's okay, as I said, in the 12th century, we're not in the 12th century. So you can see that square. I um, might have not picked up the best, um, the best um, copy of the picture from his uh, video, from his, uh, pardon me, from his work, but you will find it in some other resources. I'm sure there's something of that in my other lectures, for different modules. But basically what we have here, the square, the square in the middle is the book, the, the blue things are the students looking at the book, not at the teacher, and then they, then they report to the teacher. You can see this little yellow, yellow, two, two yellow, uh, arrows. They report to the teacher who's this rhomboid here or whatever it is, the square here. And they report to the teacher the meaning and the teacher tells them this is not the right meaning, which is what I don't want to actually call a particular methods of teaching by their name because my purpose is not to, dis you know, to discredit methods of teaching. But basically, we ha basically the teacher functions here as a police person. This is not the right reading of the script, if I could put it this way, right? So the book ter is turned into a script, and there is one way of reading the script. And you know, there's nothing, um, there's nothing uh, surprising about it because, and a lot of people, as I said in earlier classes, a lot of people have criticized this model already because it is actually it draws on the monastery teachings. And, uh, and it has been criticized for being as such, right? So basically we turn the book into a, into a sc holy script more or less with the teacher who is the, the holder of the knowledge of how to actually read it. So he's the policeman of reading. So, and, and I'll show you a picture now that I always show and people love this picture. And that's what common sense is. That's why it's worthwhile to read that, to watch, the, to watch that uh, video about common sense. For someone who, you know, during the break or something. So here it is. Everybody is smiling, sitting here now. You know that they are smiling because someone came with a, with a camera to take a picture. But how different is this picture from this one? Different era, different colors, and we have them live. But look at this. A woman center. She's not, children are not looking at the teacher, right? And this makes her think, and everyone else, that this is a good, engaging methodology. But as I said before, um, bad pedagogies were never teacher-centered, they were always script-centered. And look at this, we only look at one book. How do we know whether this book is read well? Because the teacher monitors, and maybe some students will say something. So 10 geographers we have sitting on the, on the carpet, and the policewoman there in the chair, and we have the script in front of us, and we're all reading and she will correct us. Right? There's nowhere in exploration, there are no alternatives. And if children were to actually now create a story, what they will actually have is only this one book and they will be recreating, if they are actually capable of it, they will recreate a text of the same genre, right? And what about creating a new genre? 
What about playing with different genres? I mean, there's no one way of creating a children's story. Why not play with those different ways? I was myself, I mean, I teach it, but I don't read children's stories. Um, so basically I was stunned when one of my students actually, yeah, I really love when my students actually prove me right. So there was this um, wonderful student who came to me and she said, look at this book, Anya. You probably know it because it's your job. Um, and you are also um, raised in an Australian culture, so you know those Australian texts. I'm not sure if it's an Australian text. It's called Bears, something to the effect of Bears Night Out. So it doesn't start with once upon the time or one day or something. It starts with, you know, in the bed, out of the bed, through the window, up the tree, down the tree, right? So you've got all these uh, adverbial phrases there. Nothing else. Interesting. But how did this person who created this, how did he create it? How did he, what made him so confident to publish it? When in schools, he wouldn't be, he would be told that these are not full sentences. Well, I hope not, but. So I've got here something about direct instruction. It's just sickening to read it. So there you go, you can read it, present and perform. Now I do put these, these two slides again. I have put them in again here just for your memory because it's a good research in, um, basically it's, it's still in neuroscience, but what they did basically they show that if a fruit fly, which has such a, you know, small brain and already is showing emotions and showing emotions on the basis of the past and research in neuroscience and in, in children well-being shows it too. But I just thought, why not actually show that it, the, 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 um, the sense of well-being sits so much in your limbic system, which is the most um, primitive part of your brain. We judge always by emotions. We learn through emotions. We don't learn through rationale. We learn through emotions. So the limbic system is so uh, ancient and so critical to our entire existence. And if we create situations in classroom where, whereby we just want children to talk to one another, and then they, you know, we want these ten geographers to talk to one another, and then we want them to be, I don't know, Einstein's. So sometimes schools when they, and I know teachers mean well, because I've met a number of principals also here in Darwin, and they mean really, really well, and they struggle also with the different policies and so on. But when we don't appreciate the fact that children are individuals and they need to actually develop their individual voice in order to actually feel worthwhile, what we might be doing is actually creating situations whereby we prove to children that their own inability to actually succeed and with the fruit fly, you only took one, one, one loss. One loss. So when they put, they matched the fruit fly with another fruit fly that lost as well. So there was a miserable situation and they didn't even fight or something, right? So what I'm saying is uh, when people actually do not feel they are achievers, because we have, because schools increasingly narrow our policies, especially in the Northern Territory, increasingly, they define success increasingly narrowly. But what happens, we actually build a sense of inefficacy, inability, in, in, uh, we decapacitate our students. And you can see what it will do to their well-being. We teach well-being at between 8 o'clock and 8.30 in the morning by, when children read fairy tales. And then at uh, 9 a.m., we start with literacy program with direct instruction, which basically is all about achieving in narrow terms and nothing to do with interpretation, with exercising your, vo your voice and actually being respected for your own particular ways of perceiving and looking at the world. And children are still developing. So what you sometimes might see is weirdness. I had some of that as well. And a lot of my friends had. So there are particular inability. Like I didn't have particular digestive in enzyme. I grew out of that. I had, um, what do you call it, squinted eyes. I grew out of that. You know, so my eyes were seeing things that were in there or whatever, two people instead of one. I mean, kids are like that. Kids are not organized yet. And we already judge them. This one can, this one can't, and all of that. Um, we need to give them possibilities to, to actually break down information slowly in most uh, innovative ways as we can so that they can actually 
personalize their learning and actually see things that before were invisible to them. In the past, I used to talk about this model, which is actually a response to Professor McCormack. So he has this text-based teaching, whereas I talk about project, community-based projects. So that circle in, in here, student or teams, is basically a project that students develop. They develop it by looking at different texts in order to produce a text and give it to the community. So let me repeat it, it again. The idea here is that students, I call it text here on the left, but what students do, they interact with the community. They explore text, whether spoken or written or painted, whatever forms of symbols, and they generate a project as a result, and then they share it back with the community because literacy is out of the community into the community. It is not only out of the community or out of the teacher or out of the book. It is out of the community into a community because literacy, as I said in our last classes, we were online, I said literacy evolved as our practices also evolve. We become increasingly comp an increasingly complex society. And, and people keep developing now tools in order for this complexity to be somehow managed. And whether computers were first and complexity happened or complexity was there and, co and computers developed in order to actually help, who knows? We will never know what was first, I, an egg or a chicken. But you can see that we've got these tools that enable us to actually live. So literacy didn't develop or didn't evolve as a, as a skill. It is a multitude of tools that were produced so that we could now use them in order to participate in this complex world effectively. And by effectively, I mean not if you want to send someone, uh, invite someone to a wedding, you really do not do a door knock all around Australia. You could actually send them an email or a normal snail mail, right? It just don't do it by hand, everything. So there are different, and also not everything is a newspaper. We have invitations, we have different different types of texts. So when students engage in, liter in, in literacy, they don't engage for literacy sake, they engage in order to effect something. So that's why they create something in order to then for an impact in order to actually give it, send it to someone or affect someone or share with someone or tell someone something or right? So it's never, we never read. There's no such a thing like reading and writing. What there is is participation in the society. And as a result, we see a need for reading and writing in order to send to someone or speak to someone or uh, present something that actually for, for which we actually engage in, in using literacy skills. So literacy is not for literacy, we engage in a society and then needs arise, and then we use literacy skills in order to satisfy those needs. And here's your pedagogy. There is nothing else. You cannot teach literacy away from the model for which literacy was uh, invented. Because then you're not teaching literacy, you're teaching cuckoo land. Right? So literacy is part of a society and, and, it's, and it's there for us to use it in order to actually engage with others in an effective way. All right, so now we basically come closer and closer to our unit of work. Remember, we have to work with the curriculum. We have, we have uh, priorities and capabilities. We can't get away with, from it. This is a model that I didn't really show you fully until today. Didn't want to confuse. I spoke to you before, but I have different ways of working with this model. I never know which is a good one, but here we go. You are enough now fluent at it. So what we have, cross-curricular priorities. We have capabilities here, right? Social, critical, and creative, and intercultural. So they talk to the cross-curricular priorities. Then the meaning of each of this social capability critical is here, the red bit. 
right? So you will recognize. So what social or cultural groups is the event or is our action to impact on? Um, who owns the resources that we actually use in order to actually talk to those people? Who owns those resources, right? Are we using uh, why our Anglo-Saxon or our European resources? I came to Australia and do you think I had no problems in um, integrating in Australia because I was from Europe? I had big problems in integrating in Australia. Um, so but because I was using my European or Eastern European or Polish, I don't know, whatever resources I was using, I was now acting on a different cultural group or different people. And um, yeah, I had to learn how to be. And then what kinds of groups we validate as we talk to our audiences. So you got it, you've got it all under control. But these are just sort of, these are the, the social capital, uh, cultural capital and symbolic capital. I produce these things for you. You can read it for uh, if, if it actually talks to you. These are the sort of terms that Pierre Bourdieu used. Uh, and Pierre Bourdieu is a person to know or have heard about. He's one of the greatest sociologists in the world from some probably university in Paris. Well, no, definitely university in Paris, but one, whether it was University of Paris or whatever, I'm not sure anymore. So, okay, so the, the, he talks about, so basically I explicated how to you exactly how I got those meanings of each of those capabilities. I got them actually before I read the capabilities. I've done it some time ago. So I've done them before I read the capabilities because I didn't want to read the capabilities exactly. I wanted to do it myself independently and that's what capabilities say. So we're happy with that. Uh, so what we know that we have in the world and for the world, then we have capabilities. We have these particular meanings of our capabilities. They're very important, but we know that we're in the society. So we need to know who is it to affect, what resources are we using in order to affect our audience and therefore what kind of community we validate with those resources. Are we offending people? Are we bypassing people? Are we ignoring people? Here, I was talking the other day, so you know that, again, this is again about practice, right? Literacy is about being in a society. So those <clears throat> red circles here, um, those things here, they only develop, they will develop if you actually engage children's interpretations of the world. If you don't, what happens is you're not actually building on the skills children already have, which is communication. They're pretty fluent communicators at the age of whatever, five, three, four. Um, and now you need to build on those skills. So the idea is now to actually build on those skills rather than teach literacy as it was separate. So what else do we have here? Okay, so in part two now, when we will be talking about how to design a unit of work, we will look at um, the concept of dialogue, we'll go on with the concept of dialogue, but not as a concept of dialogue in terms of two people talking, but as a dialogue is a process of evaluation. Right? Dialogue is a process of evaluation. Because even if you talk to someone else, you are still evaluating whatever you think they are saying in relation to whatever you know. So basically, learning always happens in your head and in relation to the to the way you understood whatever happens around. So you're doing all the evaluation in your own head. We could say, in a manner of speaking, we're always talking to ourselves. And just before I finish this very interesting research, just to, I mean, we know that, we know that, we know that, right? We're, we're 21st century people, we kind of know it. But what's really funny, and you, you might have seen it on television, you might have not seen it, they've done research on people and uh, in, in your science, and what happens, you can actually switch off people's hemispheres. And when you switch off, some, when you only talk to someone's right hemisphere, and you ask them, what would you like to be when you grow up? And they will say to you, a pilot? And when you talk to the other hemisphere, once the other one is switched off, they will say, um, train driver, or um, sleep, um, I mean, cleaner, 
sweeper, a cleaner or, um, I don't know, something really totally that your mother wouldn't want you to do, right? Something like, you know what I'm saying? It's very funny how we actually, even inside of us, we have these two people, minimum, minimum. Not to mention all these other neuron cells and cells that we haven't even, 90% of the brain has not even been studied yet. So we've got so many people in our heads and every thought is, comes always with someone else because someone else said it to us and we've seen it somewhere else. So we've got so many people in our heads. This dialogue is ongoing, continuous, and it is about evaluation. So it's not about talking, it's about evaluation. So dialogue is evaluation. And in that sense, if we conceptualize dialogue as evaluation, we no longer have a problem how many people have to be there. But we do have a problem if we say, well, if your evaluation is based uh, on uh, the process, you use the process whereby you actually have very few uh, you, you made very few considerations, there was not much evaluation actually happening, then we know it was poor, right? And that's why, let me re-emphasize again, one-on-one -on -one teaching might be good for something, but honestly, it will never be an ideal uh, uh, environment for teaching, because what happens, we actually reduce evaluation opportunities in this case. Okay, we need people around us. Okay, so now we move to part two. Thank you.